So it's it's a real pleasure. Um, I mean, it's 10.35, right? So, I mean, probably passed my first pot of coffee uh, just as of five seconds ago. So hopefully this, this will go. Uh, let me just ask, um, I mean, this is clearly titled Experimentalist's um, Perspective, right? And, um, okay, so I'm classified as an experimentalist, um, apparently. Um, that's a great compliment, but let me just ask, uh, are there in this room, roughly by a show of hands, who of you would classify themselves as a theorist or a theorist in making? Um, and then turning it around. Um, <laughs> and now, so, okay. Um, and now experimentalists in making. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You know, this is great to see. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, um, I mean, it's it's at least not like 99 versus 1, right? I mean, that, that would be one of those difficult um, moments at that point. So it's nicely mixed. Uh, I mean, that, that should make also for absolutely great interactions um, uh, during this call. Um, I will also say that um, Although I appreciate these sort of distinctions, they are really about specialization. At the end of the day, we're all scientists, um, I believe. I mean, that, that is the first and foremost thing. So first, uh, thanks to the organizers, Fred, Alexei, others for organizing now, I think the fourth or fifth of, or the fourth of this call. Um, thank you all. Uh, I mean, look, if I think back um, at my own PhD education, um, these calls are just fantastic to be at. Pressure them, advocate, advocate with your advisor if you need to do so, um, and enjoy, okay? And there's also a lot of future network uh, most likely to be built up in uh, inventions like this. So this is a great environment. Now, it's also true that, um, look, if you look at the program and the first speaker is George Thurman, well, no pressure, okay? Um, Lectures like these, they, they take really a village to come together. So uh, I am certainly very grateful for uh, the lectures I've participated in in the past when I was a student myself. Uh, I also owe a depth of gratitude to numerous colleagues uh, with whom I've worked over the past uh, decades on EIC, or towards EIC. Uh, and with that said, uh, I mean, I think you know who you are. Um, at the same time, any arrows are, of course, my own. And now in terms of reading, um, maybe that's an experimentalist thing. Um, for me at least, it, it's always um, sort of you read something or you listen to a lecture first and then you think like, yeah, yeah, okay, that kind of makes sense, maybe. Uh, then you start to calculate something and uh, at times that works, sometimes it doesn't. At that point, you know, like, hmm, I probably should go back uh, because I'm missing something. And of course you need to read. Uh, okay, and uh, well, any introductory uh, elementary particle physics book has a chapter on EIS, so that's a good entry point for EIC, I would say, but it's not a complete entry point, of course. Uh, it would also be um, kind of limiting if we don't acknowledge the enormous role that ERA has played towards an EIC. Uh, it can, it's, it's really hard to overstate that role. And there are actually uh, write-ups from old schools. Luckily, we don't do that for CFNS schools. I mean, uh, but a very good one, at least in my opinion, is uh, is this uh, this particular one by Gunther Wolf. It's easily accessible in on Inspire, uh, even though it's it's only uh, listed as an um, internal note here. Uh, then, of course, there's the community's white paper. I'm sure that uh, most of you who are here have seen or heard about it at some point. It's worthwhile to open. It's not too thick. There is a yellow report at this point, which is thick. So think twice. Um, treat that more as an uh, Encyclopedia Britannica that hasn't stood the test of time yet. Uh, but it's certainly a valuable reference. Okay, so now the goals for these lectures. There are two of them, uh, right? So one is today um, and one is tomorrow. Uh, today, I think uh, we are in good shape. We come better, uh, come out of it with, uh, come out of the school. The result of uh, these lectures, uh, better understanding, let's say, the, the context of an EIC compared to, let's say, other alternatives uh, that may have happened in the past, such as HERA, or that are part of our possible future, and also maybe where some of the 
overlaps and dividing lines live between nuclear physics and high energy physics emphasis. So discovery, um, I would say, is, is first and foremost versus understanding how matters work uh, more. So if we come out of that, uh, this call uh, with a bit better understanding of uh, context uh, and capabilities that are afforded by the EIC, that's, uh, that's good. Um, the second goal, and that's more for tomorrow, is actually in this, this figure. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this type of figure. Um, only for those, I think, with uh, photographic memory, you need to look at it in a flash um, and you're done. Um, in practice, there is quite a bit in this figure that um, is uh, just, you look at it, you think like, yeah, okay, maybe that makes sense. Um, you look at it again and you go like, oh, there's a layer more to it. Uh, so uh, if we uh, come out of this with a better understanding, for example, that could be uh, even as simple as understanding why this particular region of the world is focused on low X physics, Whereas that region is more about large X physics, uh, that's already a game, depending where you're coming from. And there's more to it, of course. Now, um, let me also just strip a lot of the words from the, uh, the opening uh, slide and focus on this, this graphic. Um, I still find it amazing that uh, at this point, actually, if we just step through our textbooks, right? I mean, we have atomic physics, if you wish, over there. We have nuclear physics clearly separated in terms of its distance and energy scales. And then somehow as we get closer, uh, or zoom in closer and closer, you have this object called a proton that is yet again an order of magnitude removed from a nucleus, which is apparently a densely packed object that seems to have effective degrees of freedom like a proton. And then we can ask further questions like, well, hey, what is the internal stru structure of that? And maybe as we get down to quarks, you could even ask if you're a high energy physicist, what is the substructure of a quark? Is, is that fundamental or not? Um, well, in terms of EIC, I would say that that one is uh, more or less in this uh, this regime. Yes, the high energy physics opportunities, if you think about those as um, discovery of, for example, substructure of uh, leptons that might happen, or quarks that's that probably beyond reach. Uh, yes, you never know. Though. Now, uh, as to the the two graphics which I'm adding. Um, here, what you see is actually a setup of the Rutherford experiment. And here you see an icon. I see. There's not yet a setup to show for it, but it will come. Uh, I would say that uh, the development of this, even though we find it in textbooks and it's typically, um, let's say, fully worked out and it seems to be a very linear path, it's actually a history of new insight that has come from new capability in many cases. And that's not the one we underestimated, right? This goes very much at the interplay between experiment and theory and in our fields, uh, including accelerator, including lattice QCD. Uh, phenomenology, it's um, truly a collaborative effort, I should say, and with mutual dependencies and interdependencies. So we could ask the question, what is a proton neutron or a nucleus? And of course, uh, if you ask your low energy friends, uh, they will show you something like this probably also where an atomic physicist may start. And isn't it amazing that indeed we have some form of ordering in there, but isn't it equally amazing that all of that seems to be determined by pretty simple properties, namely proton neutron spin and their masses at the end of the day. Now, if you ask your high energy physics friends, you probably get this answer. Uh, and uh, you would hear like, oh, well, uh, proton, yeah, two up quarks and a down quark. Um, okay. All good. Um, in the end, it is probably a question that depends a lot on the scale at which you probe this. Um, so where we can agree, I think, is that a proton is a strongly bound object, has a size of about 0.8 Fermi. You can ask the question, how do we know that? What size do you actually mean? And those are very good questions. Uh, we also know that it has a mass of about a GeV, give or take 6%. Uh, and it is a spin one half object uh, for all that we know. None of that is a standard model parameter in any way or form in the end. Um, also, we know at this point that theoretically we, we are quite far. So QCD has really advanced by leaps and bounds over the past well, 40, 50 years. Um, at the same time, um, look, 
QED is often linked to the transistor, right? I think we are not yet at the stage where QCD has direct applications of that societal impact. I'm not saying that that is a goal, but you could ask the question, um, what about QCD engineering? And then I think we all acknowledge that we're far from that at this point. Now, EIC, uh, that's about a combination of strengths, and the combination of these strengths actually results in a new capability that we are afforded here. Um, so let's just start way, way back. I'll, I'll try to be brief about this, this history, but I think it is important to outline where the new capabilities came about. So um, back in the early 1900s, uh, I mean, beams uh, basically came about from decay. For reasons of curiosity, uh, certainly not thinking about, uh, let's say the shell model and our processes in the sun, Almost for sure. I've never asked uh, the authors, of course, because that's even before my time set aside whether they would be uh, willing to, to respond. Uh, but uh, an experiment came about scattering these, uh, these beams, alpha sources as we now understand them, or alpha particles on a gold foil. And surprise, surprise, at backward scattering angles, there's actually a cross section that is um, tiny. Uh, but not uh, non-zero. And the inside of that is indeed the 10 to the 14th for a typical nucleus, the size, point-like object, as opposed to, let's say, a sheet, which would be our daily first guess, right? I mean, this table, for example, is, is a sheet, right? It's not nucleus with a point-like particle. Again, I mean, the advance and capability is the beam. Of course, it's the cleverness of an experiment to come up with it. Uh, and the surprise actually sits in measuring small quantities in this case. That's a thing that comes back quite often. Quite often in physics, I find that people go like, oh, we should look for the biggest and the best. Well, actually, this region would have been pretty boring, no matter what you do. It's, it's indeed about the smallness here, uh, but the non-zeroness comes back a few times. Now, uh, go back or we'll go further, uh, about um, 50 years or so, and actual uh, Particle beams have come about with a top energy of about 200 MeV. Okay, so accelerated electrons. Uh, what that allows you to do in the end is, of course, instead of uh, having these alpha sources, you can probe a proton. And if you have a higher energy, you intuitively sense that you probe a finer structure. It's indeed what is seen. And well, indeed, you find that this has a sharply falling uh, slope. Um, and again, I would say that the surprises or the insights come about actually where that cross section is remarkably small. Okay, so if you would go by the statement, oh, I need to measure the biggest and I don't care about the 1% effects in the end, you actually miss out on the new insights. Okay, the new insights here, um, I would argue, are first and foremost that the proton itself has a size of about 0.7 Fermi, at least probed with a scattered electron, so with an exchanged photon, meaning it's probing a charge radius like quantity. And in addition to that, uh, it actually does not follow the um, infinitely heavy curve, the mod curve. It doesn't follow a Dirac curve, which you would expect for a spin one half object without internal structure. Um, well, we know that there is an anomalous moment uh, for a long time, long before the 1960s. It actually doesn't even follow that curve. Instead, it sits somewhere in between. There's apparently an intriguing internal structure going on. Okay, so elastic electron scattering, right? I mean, um, we've heard about this now, this morning. How would that work? So as an experimentalist, what do you do? You go and ask your theory friends. You show them this diagram and well, you throw up your hands, you say, I'm before my first pot of coffee, how does this work? And beyond, let's say, having a sense that uh, there's probably um, basically an um, interchange or an uh, interaction between two charged objects that at least one of them is moving. So intuitively you would sense like, hey, there's an electric structure to it and a magnetic structure to it. Well, your theory friend will then say, well, okay, I mean, QED we know, um, and the cross section is described by a contraction of two tensors, and this is the lepton tensor, at least as long as that is unpolarized. And now go figure out, read a little bit more. Uh, now by symmetries, uh, you can indeed come up with what would be the most general form of this, this nucleon tensor, and where would it matter? And the way that is done is with these um, five 
factor is K, right? I mean, if you don't know what to come up with, what do you do? You smooth with a symbol and subscript because, well, I mean, you could call it finger one, thumb, pointing finger, or other, but we are a creative bunch, so we do K sub one. Hey, K3 is missing here. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, uh, you would probably link it to a difference here. And then if you look at this thing, because it's symmetric, it actually doesn't matter. So you don't need to consider K3. Um, furthermore, if you go a little bit further, and I fancy words for that, of course, you could contract uh, this tensor simply. If you set this to zero, you find out that there's a, a relation between, well, K4 and K1 and K2, and K5 and K1 and K2 as well, K2 specifically. So there are two k's that matter. Indeed, an electric and a magnetic form factor, if you wish. Uh, so that is what you then see reflected in the cross section. And it turns out as an experimentalist, you're able to separate that by indeed measuring and resolving that angle. Okay. Now, uh, inelastic scattering, of course, that is much more difficult, that, right? Because look, kinematically, it's, it's um, really quite different here. You have many more particles coming out. So what do you do? Well, first thing you do, of course, is ignore this, this outgoing state. That's called inclusive in a last <laughs> scattering in the end. Um, again, here you have this contraction of tensors. And well, since um, we need a different symbol, uh, the symbol now is W, uh, but the math actually is rather very similar. Uh, in the end, you again end up with two structure functions. It is still an interaction of to charged objects of some sort. So indeed, an electric-like structure function and a magnetic-like structure function. You also have invariants in this problem, multiple of them. Two of them that are well known is Q squared. Uh, think of that as the wavelength of this photon squared. Uh, the other one being X, Jurgen X. Uh, that is often um, called the fraction of the struck part on as this proton is uh, broken up. Uh, that's a um, one interpretation. Uh, the, the bottom line is that, that it's of course an invariance. Now, this is all nice, so much for the symmetries. The, the physics, if you wish, or the new insights really sits in the structure functions. So these things that we have boringly called A's and W's. And okay, if you thought that this was all simple, then go and calculate heavy ion collisions. Okay, and do that for the first principle. Yes, that's, that's great. Go for it. Knock your heart out. So, um, now I think that the key insight in, in our description, and it's just stunningly useful and powerful, was that we could um, indeed uh, just uh, think of this as uh, some of elastic scans in the end. So, okay, let's, um, let's work this through a little bit, right? I mean, I think we've seen most of this uh, by now in multiple lectures. Um, in the end, uh, if we think of this um, spherical cow in vacuum as a collection of quarks, and we have indeed this elastic scattering of individual quarks, hey, we have the math that is similar to elastic scattering, but if these quarks don't have an internal structure, maybe it has strong similarities with electron muon scattering. We've seen that math in textbooks, right? I mean, we don't need to redo it. We can look it up. And yes, we had that at some point, and that's the experimentalist perspective, of course. So working that through, you get powerful things out of your structure functions. Yeah, there's these electric, oops. Okay, I clearly should not stand. There's interference there. Okay, that's, that's important experimentally, actually. Um, um, look, your structure functions, F1 and F2, right? I mean, the important insight that you get out of, call it a model, like this actually is that these structure functions do not depend on Q squared, which we thought about as this wavelength. In other words, you're probing a point, but once you've probed the point, there's no wavelength dependence to it anymore. It doesn't have a size. Okay, this is something you can experimentally test, the absence of a Q squared dependence. In addition to that, uh, if you're indeed elastically scattering of a spin one half point-like particle as a G factor of two, it actually couples this electric and magnetic form factor, if you want to think about it in that way. That means that for these, these structure functions, you get relations between F1 and F2. Again, testable. That, of course, has been done. The breakthrough there, again, comes a decade or two later, when we were not longer dealing uh, as a society with 200 MeV beams, but rather with beams that had reached an energy that is 10 times the proton energy itself. 
and indeed you destroy it. Now, expectation from elastic scattering is this rapidly falling cross section. And again, it is, of course, this part that dominates the total number of observations if you're not careful. But as you extend out, in this case, in this Q squared value, you see that actually you get an excess over this minimal expectation that is driven by inelastic scattering. Okay, so it's again people that just have the courage to look in places where you have low expectations. Do that as an experimentalist, you may get surprised. Now, this figure, I think everyone has seen in the end, right? I mean, this is this um, me standing behind this thing again, so that it interferes. Let me stand in front of it and I'll get out of your way in a second. This we've all seen. Fortuitous um, independence of um, the cross section, if you wish, or the structure function with X. What we've may, maybe not so often seen is um, the relation between these two structure functions. So, this linking of electric and magnetic structure over a g factor equal to which is precisely this Dirac um, matter which is precisely about the difference between spin one half and spin zero particles uh, so this tells us that quarks have spin half if you want to go that far of course there are fancy words to it now again looking a decade later um, i think this is uh, part of the, the opening lecture of course and the renewed interest in spin physics not to be underestimated what was needed for it. If you're not convinced of this, just think about it. What does it take to polarize an electron? Maybe a good discussion topic for the evening, and then do the same thing. What does it take to polarize a proton? Of course, you can say, well, okay, it's, it's not so hard, right? I mean, you cool the thing down to a couple of Kelvin. Okay, how do you do that with the 10 GPP? That is how you want to go about it. Good question experimentally. Maybe sources are actually quite difficult and it's not about just storing electrons in a magnetic field and cooling this entire thing down. You want to get these electrons out in one form or the other. And now think about protons, right? I mean, if you do the same thing in a cryogenic target, temperatures, you can reach fractions of a Kelvin nowadays. That's great with enough power. Just calculate it out of Boltzmann statistics, what kind of polarizations you will get, and then ask yourself whether you can do experiments with that or whether this is actually an intricate atomic physics experiment. In the way I put it forward, yes, it is a very intricate atomic physics experiment. So, okay, the renewed interest, this is of course always the figure you get to see, right? I mean, you integrate over this non perturbative value of X, what you get is, uh, is an integral, hopefully, right? I mean, you're always missing a fraction of um, the phase space, so it's always an extrapolation. And what you do, it's far below expectations of the time. Again, what you see here actually is that experimental capability is to a large extent indeed about developing this polarization, but it is also about probing beyond the smallest 10% of your X range. Small X matters a lot. 90% okay? of the problem often means that you've missed out on 10% that gives you the surprises. Okay, uh, for those of you who have been concerned, um, I've lived at CERN for a little bit, and for years I walked by this thing, not internalizing at all what it is or what. It's a bubble chamber in the end, and it's an amazing piece, again, of capabilities that were added with different types of beams. In this case, neutrino beams. What have we learned from it? Well, actually, we've learned from it that neutrino scattering and lepton scattering of a proton or a neutron is quite similar. We furthermore learn from it is that there's a scaling factor between them. It looks pretty cool. <laughs> C is the, the large experimental uncertainties, which are so associated with neutrinos, then the smaller uncertainties that are associated with lepton scattering. Lepton beams are easier, cross sections are larger, all of that experimental question, good one. You have never seen the square root of n type thing. It's a good discussion topic for the evening. Uh, but what you see is that if you scale these um, structure functions that occur there, you actually get the same answer over a very large range in X. Um, so what that tells us in the end is that the quark charges are non-integer, something we've never seen in nature uh, directly. Yeah. Okay, so two thirds and one third, so that's how that comes about. Furthermore, you could play the same trick as what we have done with uh, the spin before. You could integrate over this value of X and what you end up with is that um, you have only half of the, the nuclear momentum. There is the other half, and that uh, then sits with the missing piece, the gluons that hold these problems together. 
see here a discovery display, uh, right? So it is uh, scattering in the ends and it's a higher order process. That's another thing. There's a great value in precision. And of course, if you compare the Feynman diagram, this one versus the one above over there, what you see immediately is like, hey, there's an additional coupling constant in that. So it's, it's a suppressed process. It must have a smaller cross section. Well, maybe so. Uh, that doesn't make it not worthwhile to look at. On the contrary, by looking at it, you have the discovery of the glue in this particular case. And indeed, they carry about half uh, the nucleon momentum. So what picture do we now have of this, uh, this problem? Well, it's something like this, right? I mean, so initially, it's thinking our high energy physics friends, uh, because then there is a structure. Uh, I mean, of course, all these quarks just share a third or so of the momentum, a third of the mass, whichever way that works. Um, maybe they have some smearing, right? Because it's not a fully static problem. And then um, we also now know that gluons exist, higher order processes are interesting. So there's probably some sort of radiation, momenta can only get smaller. So you have some sort of radiative tail. And that only came to fruition with the first EIC, namely Hera. So this is part one, uh, let's say, of getting this context, Hera context. Um, so what was Hera and what is the new capability there? The new capability comes about from colliders. So it's not longer fixed target experiments, but colliders. Okay. Nearly one TeV proton beam over here collided with, let's say, 25 to 30 GeV electrons in two sort of 10 year like campaigns of running with an intermediate upgrade. That seems also sort of the lifetime of a typical facility. Think about WIC, for example, for those of you who are involved in that. Um, okay, look, um, that's all great. How does that new capability in this case come about? It matters for ESC. So let's have a look at uh, at least the kinematics of this, right? I mean, we can all do that even before our second part of coffee, I hope. Um, so by convention, uh, also EIC, all of EIC physics will follow the Hira convention when you write down these sort of kinematics. So what do you have? Well, you have electron beam with its form momentum over there. Uh, of course, you have the, the scattering, right, which you might be able to observe. And you might even get your pointer there if you uh, don't interfere with your uh, big interference blob here. Um, well, proton, that traditionally is then picked as the positive z-axis. You have a couple of invariants. The important one is the uh, square of the total central mass energy, S. Um, I'm just going to go here and have that thing over there. Um, uh, other invariants uh, are indeed about Q squared, but we have each of four and X. Right? So, listed them here. Oh, okay, there's also a range problem. We learn more and more uh, um, as experimentalists, uh, right? So, these, these are good finger formulas to just um, <coughs> as, as you engage in EIC. Um, but let's take that, that a small step further and just do a couple of calculations with it, right? I mean, uh, so let me just ask, what was the maximum center of mass energy achieved at Hera given a 920 GeV proton beam and a 27 and a half GeV electron beam? Does anyone know? Or does anyone calculate quickly? Okay. 920 GeV. So almost a TeV. Yeah. And then in the case of the electron beam, it's, it's 27 and a half GeV, uh -huh. right? So that's sort of 10% more than 25. So if, if I um, am the naive experimentalist again, right? I mean, this was about an experimental perspective and I am to do this in front of um, 30 smarter people, uh, then um, look, let's have a look at this. Uh, scratch our head again, how these contractions worked. There was a minus sign in that, right? Um, so what do you get? Uh, well, you get something like an E plus P and you get an E minus P. In this, you need to square this stuff and take a difference. So, okay, those are the same terms, right? I mean, it's just A minus B squared. What, does that is? what is that? Well, that's something like A squared plus B squared minus two AB. So you get that twice. So it's probably four times E E times E P. That's S, okay? Now, uh, the numbers here were not so bad. Right, I mean, where were they? The other button. Uh, the numbers here were 10% less than a TeV. 
So let's start with the TEV and 10% more than 25 GeV. Now we can multiply that four times 25 is 100, right? Times uh, a TEV, so it's all the TEV squared. We take the, the square root of that. So the square root of that, hmm, that, that may be hard. Well, okay, factors 10, any experimentalist will know that that's how you misestimate any project you take on, right? Um, and what are those? Those are kind of pi, like pi squared, right? I mean, whenever you make an estimate, it's, it's wrong by pi squared, pi times e, e squared, if you're really good. Uh, but that's more or less what it is. This is kind of pi squared. So indeed, the center of mass energy is about 314 or so uh, GeV. So we can do that, uh, right? Um, now, for a 10 to the fifth center of mass energy, what is the minimum Björk and X ask? And how does that come about? So, okay, um, how does it work? For a Q squared of one GeV, uh, 10 to the fifth in S, and Y, which is an invariant that is bound between zero and one, the minimum is clearly one over 10 to the fifth, so 10 minus five, easy to calculate, right? Um, now, maybe as a bonus, uh, anyone who is not convinced about the power of uh, colliders, um, just calculate what um, the fixed target beam energy would need to be uh, if you would need to build an electron beam to probe at the same small values of X. Um, that's an interesting exercise. Anyone with a piece of paper can just do that uh, on the side. Um, you'd be surprised. Okay, now for the evening, um, I, I really think it is actually important, as trivial as it may sound, uh, work through some of the kinematics here. It will serve you over and over and over again. And the only way to get intuition for it, as an experimentalist at least, is to just calculate, put numbers to it. So for an X value of 10 minus three, a Q squared value of 10 GeV squared, what is the scattered electron energy and what is the scattering angle? So in other words, where do I need to put my detector and what does my detector need to be capable? That's really what we're asking, right? Now, if you want to go further um, and you want to go graduate beyond the inclusive scattering, then calculate also what the angle is of the star quark or the current jet. Okay, and maybe calculate that what it would be in a fixed target experiment, right? I mean, you in the end calculated already this electron energy. So just do that and ask yourself, is there a difference in the event topology? And might you benefit from that as the experiment? Good preparation for tomorrow's lecture. Um, now, in terms of the measurements, okay, this radiative tail. So convincingly seen, as, as you see here, right? I mean, from very early um, HERA data. So probing smaller and smaller values of X, you actually see an enormous rise of this um, cross-section in the end from both experiments. And the thing really is that one just looked in, let's say, the smallest 10% or so of the X range. Right? I mean, of course, you plot it on a logarithmic scale because that's more favorable for your data. Uh, the second thing you see that this actually has a different structure uh, between two different Q squared values, right? I mean, twice larger over here. My finger is better than this, twice larger over there. So the question is, can these two be related? And that, I think, is uh, probably the thing that came to full fruition out of HERA. And the answer is yes, and it's actually intuitive. Even for an experimentalist, it's intuitive. What happens? your quarks radiate gluons. They can do that in various ways, but it's probably governed by probabilities in the end. If you have a gluon that in turn can split up in a quark anti-quark pair, again, governed by probabilities, and it could split up in gluons <coughs> themselves. So if you have those probabilities, you go back to your theory friend and you ask like, how do I do this convolution in the end? Um, now, the first thing they will do is they will lecture you that this is one way of looking at the problem, but it's incomplete. Where is it incomplete? Well, your gluons don't recombine. So if you have many of them. If they can split, they can certainly merge. You've ignored that here. Okay. Um, do we actually have environments that are so gluon dense that this matters? Um, good experimental question. Uh, likewise, I mean, look, spectators and such, they just go on. Um, so how does this work in practice then? Well, your theory friend will tell you that the dependencies are logarithmic, that the convolution looks roughly something like this, and that part of it is calculable. However, that the number of gluons and the number of quarks uh, is something you would actually want to measure. That is harder to predict. Your lattice QCD friend may say differently, by the way. 
So you can do that. Um, you can write it down. And how does how does it work in uh, the end? Well, this, of course, in terms of animation, doesn't work. So uh, if we imagine a particle that lives here at some value of q squared prime, then where did it originate from? If you want to think in terms of these evolutions, well, it actually um, originated from any other particle in this area evolved. Okay, so what it means in the end is that if you make a measurement over a particular X range at any value of Q squared, you're in principle able to derive or to determine the distribution Q of X within that range at any value of Q squared. Okay, that is the power here. That is why, at least in experiments, you don't have a need, and you cannot in most cases, Totally make a slice that sits at a fixed Q squared. So it's one of the very powerful experimental methods that means that you can relate multiple measurements and even multiple experiments. And I'll make sure that in the uploaded version, the animation actually is, is expanded. So, so, okay, you see this at work over here. This is the legacy of HERA in terms of its data. What you see is uh, cross sections that span many orders of magnitude actually in Q squared, right? I mean, here's 10 to the fifth, here's one. It's five orders of magnitude. See fully understood Q squared dependence that agrees stunningly well with the 1400 or so data points that are here. And do that all within, say, a handful plus a toe or five uh, of parameters. You even see electroweak interferences at the largest Q squareds. Um, what you also see is this traditional thing that at higher values of X, particles radiate to smaller. Um, values um, of X, whereas uh, you see the opposite, the gain of particle number uh, at small values of X um, with Q squared. Were those lines straight? Did you draw correction? Yes. Yeah, okay, let me just uh, look. So here is also one of those fortuitous, uh, fortuitous experimental things, right? I mean, we started out with this uh, Bjorken scaling and it so happened that the experiments basically focused on this, this valence region here, where it turns out that this is rather flat. And of course, look, measuring flatness is always about how wide is your range, how large are your uncertainties, uh, but that's how history goes, right? I mean, if you do the first experiment, you can get away with um, uncertainties that are not so great. Uh, your second experiment better be better. In the end, and significantly better. So it is somewhat fortuitous that those insights came about in this form in the end and hold to date. Makes you wonder in how many cases we actually have lost descriptions, right? I mean, that's the thing of hindsight. It's always this very linear process. And in practice, it is about trial, error, failure, try again, never give up. And half of the concepts go out of the window in the end, both experimentally and theory. Um, okay, so what did we learn from this vast data set? Well, that's basically um, in many people's minds, all there is to learn about the proton. And you see that over here. So we have a clear valence structure with D quarks and U quarks, right? So this high energy starting point, or this, this Gelman's Mike starting point. And then we have a very rapidly rising gluon distribution. Note that it's suppressed here by a factor of 20. And note also that what is plotted here is X times the distribution, right? With X being a small number. So it goes up really quickly. In the end. Uh, and how did that come about? It came about from the collider and the wide kinematic range. Now that's great uh, because it also has allowed us to make predictions for all sorts of other systems. You see it over here, and that now goes well beyond next to leading order, actually. And that's, that's of course where you can slow down your theory friends, right? You need to calculate next to next to leading order. That's when they start to slow down, fortunately. Yeah. I mean, in that way, you don't need to be too concerned that it takes 10 years to build a new experiment. Sure. So that's not how you do it, right? I mean, EIC is about next to, next to, next to, uh, just throwing it out there. Um, okay, um, this is stunningly successful, powerful. And in the end, uh, we have only 14 parameters out of 1400 data points. That's a good data reduction, right? I mean, it's, it's a little bit more than a hand, but two hands. Now there's truth in advertising, there's complementarity between HERA and let's say the ongoing collider experiments like the LHC. It's maybe a bit technical. Uh, there are experts here in the room. It's again an excellent evening discussion. You can ask the question, for example, what happens with jet measurements at the LHC where we saw the linkage? Where do they have an impact 
And where do they not? And which experiments are more important? Is that ATLAS? Is it CMS? Is it a combination of the two? Is there consistency between the two measurements? Uh, so that is what you see in these sort of chi-squared curves that are shown here. Uh, again, I think an excellent evening uh, discussion topic. And if you're interested in reading more about it, um, I point you to this archive. So now you can also ask questions about flavor structure or flavor structure. Of course, that is still largely open when it comes to strange quarks. But that also means if you want to make an impact in an EIC, you must do particle identification. Okay, there's no option out of that. Uh, Hira did not really have that. Okay, now Hira, wonderful, right? I mean, we learned a lot, but we actually only learned about the proton. Uh, so they're voids. It's easy to criticize. Different way of looking at it. This is where new experiments have their strengths. And this is indeed a large part of the EIC program that you see there. It's the voids left by prior generation of experiments. So to recap this, uh, this, this actually uh, may seem like a long introduction and long context. But I think it's um, important to understanding large parts of the new capabilities afforded by an EIC. So look, DIS is good for you. I hope we've convinced each other of that. If you don't think so, well, the coffee is over there, um, right? Um, look, it is quite stunning that incoherent scattering combination with calculable QCD radiation has given us so much insight in multiple systems over vast energy ranges. I mean, this, this is just a triumph of calculational ability. But right yet, we're still far away from QCD engineering. So great predictive powers, gluons, furthermore, are a very important part of the nucleon if you probe them in collisions. Okay, so if you go back to this opening slide, it's neither this effective degree of freedom in this nuclear chart, nor the two up quarks and the down quark. Okay, everyone still somewhat awake? Or good. Um, I'll not do the show of hands at this point, uh, okay? Uh, look, so we can ask what is that proton neutron or nucleus, right? I mean, at this point, I think, um, say, well, it's maybe a bit of a boring um, boring thing, right? I mean, it, it seems to be a one-dimensional thing with momenta. And if you measure it at one scale, you know it at all scales. So what, what is there to it? There's no correlations to study. And really, is, is our proton just your broadband beam of gluons? in your LHC experiment, is there more to it? So there is actually quite a bit more to it. And again, this, this is the topic I would say for anyone currently involved in nuclear physics that I'm aware of, that is after studying hadronic structure. Um, and that extends to very high energies at this point. So of course, scientifically, you want to push this to its boundaries, right? I mean, just because it has worked within your scope, that means you should look beyond your scope, look wider. So to give you some surprises, going back to this matter of as gluons can split, can they recombine and where would that occur? In the end, I think everyone would be convinced that eventually it has to occur, but it's an experimental question where that is. Have we seen hints of that? So we've certainly seen various new scaling behaviors that are consistent with, but not uniquely defined by this effect of recombination. Uh, we've also seen quite astounding measurements from Rick in the forward region, complicated to interpret. So in that sense, not conclusive, but you certainly see a suppression in light systems at this point. We've now also seen an A to the one third dependence that you would intuit for saturation effects if those are at play. So this has been measured now with three nuclei. Um, that's, that's enough, right? I mean, some people want to do that with two nuclei. Three is better than two. Okay, and this is the first one. So criticize this for all you want in an evening session. Thanks for a great discussion. Um, it's tantalizing. We have hints, uh, but we don't have conclusive proof. So as an experimentalist, you say, hmm, I need to look further. New capability in the end, because the old capability didn't do so far. Then the spin puzzle, uh, right? I mean, we left that open. But in the end, it's pretty clear that uh, quarks, quark spins do not account for the proton spin. We now know that there is gluon spin. Would expect that also simply by radiation that there is something of that sort. So these sort of statements always need to be made at a specific scale. 
And even at a non-perturbative scale, we now have evidence for gluon polarization. So apparently polarized gluons are part of the intrinsic structure of the proton. We have seen evidence now also in the polarized sector that there is a difference between anti-up quark polarization and anti-down quark polarization without any questions about fragmentation and such. And of course, lattice QCD is, uh, is telling us more and more, but this is far from a solved problem at this point, in particular, if you start to ask questions about orbital momentum. So I like this graphic a lot, actually, this representation, because it helps me understand, right? I mean, look, the theory perspective, start there, the generalized, most generalized distribution, the experimental perspective, start here. Proton has a charge, and you probably know what it is. Graduate yourself to the part on distribution function, and then if you want to go further, pick one of two choices, go into a transverse momentum dependent distribution or into a generalized part on distribution, okay? Now, in terms of experiments, right? I mean, what has it done? It has graduating from charge and charge radius in the end to a part on distribution function has given us momentum. Charge radius is maybe something that is a spatial object. For an orbital momentum, you need to combine the two in one form or the other. Do you do that over a momentum space distribution or do you do that over a momentum momentum distribution? Are those the same? Should they Fourier transform into each other? Well, then you go again back to your theory friend and they will say, no, they don't do that because they're different projections. As we all know from child times, right, projections can do very, very funny things. I, I will not impersonate it, but I think we can all think about um, various ways. So, okay, that gets us to EIC, right? I mean, so what do we need to do? Uh, combine the strengths. Of course, that, that we have use existing investments that also makes matters a little bit more palatable. Pursue luminosity. We want to go to higher order processes, right? I mean, additional particles being produced, additional coupling constants. So think in terms of steps in a coupling constant. What is the coupling constant? In some cases, it may be one over 137. So 100 times the luminosity is kind of the minimum you would want to shoot for. Maybe the coupling is bigger, it could be 0.1. Okay, then you still want to have several orders of magnitude. So clearly an important one. Energy would be great. Um, hard to afford at this point within the US in, uh, in multiple ways. So EIC will not sit at the energy frontier. Okay, so we had this 10 minus 5 calculation before, right, of X minimum for ERA. For the EIC, that is probably an order of magnitude larger in the end, and that's, that's a loss in a way. That's how you want to think about it. On the other hand, you make up for that with the versatility in your nuclear systems. So you can collide ev everything under the sun, I would say, between protons and uranium. And in addition to that, you have polarization capabilities, which you did not have before, or at least the light nuclei, and these are currently under uh, discussion. Protons are, I would say, given, given the success of the RIC program, Neutrons are hard, helium-3, again, is within the baseline capabilities of think about lithium. Luminosity, we discussed, right? I mean, two or three orders of magnitude more. Of course, we want to have multiple experiments. Well, okay, you need to start with one, as we'll see tomorrow. And of course, it needs to be in our lifetime. Um, well, okay, um, I wish us all prosperous health. This ought to be within our lifetime. Let's, let's agree on that, uh, right? I mean, this is foreseeable in a way. Now is the time to engage in preparations. Okay, now this is the write-up actually that if you read one write-up about the EIC, read this one, okay? But do that after you've read that textbook and maybe these lectures about HERA because you will gain a lot. Um, what you will see is that the new capabilities, maybe each and in every one in and by themselves may not appear so unique. Combination, however, is completely unique. Never before have we collided lepton beams with heavy nuclei beams. Okay, and EIC will do that. That means that you get all the power of a collider experiment on a dense gluon environment. It offers you an opportunity to probe this very dense gluonic medium. In addition to that, you have this luminosity that allows you to look for processes where an additional particle comes out that may have a transverse momentum or even an exclusive process, which is of course rare. I mean, how can you pump a large amount of energy into a, pro into a proton and expect it to stay intact? Well, um, 
adequately instrumented, you may see all of that. that even though it may be rare, build your experiment such as you can do it. Okay, so these are capabilities that are in combination very good. Uh, the questions that um, can or will be addressed uh, are listed here. These of course get a little bit woolly, right? I mean, how do you do that in the end? I mean, if I ask you like, well, how are the C quarks and gluons and their spins distributed in space and momentum inside the nucleus? That's almost a question like, well, find X and then somebody will point you to the X on the triangle. Um, of course, you need to translate these sort of questions into actual measurements, right? I mean, how are they distributed? Well, roughly like this. Okay, that doesn't help. Uh, what measurements do you have? What predictions? What tests, etc.? How does this back coupling work? Um, this, this paper is organized in four themes in the end with four cartoon pictures to it. I show them here. So what you see here uh, on uh, the leftmost side is um, on the horizontal axis, the contribution of quark spins to the proton spin. And on the vertical axis, the uh, contribution from gluon spins. So it's one of those contour plots. You see the current knowledge, which is, um, well, if you look at these scales, I mean, note that the scales here are different right, by about an order of magnitude. At the moment in our understanding, it's very easy to hide about two H bar units in um, the experimental uncertainties on the form. Polarization contribution to the proton spin, so you know next to nothing about it uh, by current extrapolations for whatever extrapolations are really worth. And of course, the goal is to narrow that down. And indeed, you see that an ERC will achieve near parity on these, these observables to the point where you can actually start as an experimentalist make subtractions and say like, oh, well, the angular momentum will be positive or negative. And then your theory friend will just run out of the room. Okay, thank you for staying. Um, the other one is that, that we have the opportunity to look inside that, that proton or deuteron or nucleus even and ask about spatial distributions. And you see here density plots of, um, in this case, uh, the up quarks inside a polarized proton, but, uh, polarization is transverse. So apparently you have some sort of rotating objects and the cross sections are different if you probe with the electromagnetic probe. Well, the dense gluon environments we spoke about. The other thing is of course about particle propagation through nuclear matter. Right? Particle propagation through matter is essentially everything we know about detectors. It's all about particle propagation through material. Much of that is an atomic process, of some sort. Even for that reason in and by itself, it also intrigued any experimentalist what happens in a nuclear environment. Okay, so what does this paper do? In the end, well, it um, seeks to translate these questions into observables. And then it seeks to go further and link that back to measurement capabilities you need. And now truth in advertising, this, this may seem very linear, right? As you know, I want to measure this. Um, well, that means that I need to, well, I want to answer this question. That means that I need to measure that. And I need to do it with that precision. That's sort of, um, if you ask somebody a bit further in their career, right? I mean, it seems very linear. And if, if you're a student or a postdoc, you think like, oh my God, this never works that linear. Well, guess what? It doesn't. It only does so 20 years later, right? So indeed the yellow report or the, the white paper took many years to develop. That's why it appears linear. That's an iterative process. Uh, now, in fairness, the yellow report has gone further. It's also an order of magnitude thicker. Okay, so it's sort of the Encyclopedia Britannica, except that it hasn't start, stood the test of time yet. Okay, so be a bit careful with reading the yellow reports, unless you have nothing else to read. Um, now, about spin, right? I mean, so here we have the processes that we want to follow. You see the variety. In the end, of course, there is inclusive deep inelastic scattering. There's also the aspect of the electron weak interaction to it, okay, charge current interactions in the end, different experimental requirements, actually. Of course, we want to look for higher order processes, an important one, semi-inclusive deep inelastic scattering, key to measuring these TMDs. And we want to look for exclusive processes, key to GPDs in the end. We want to do that with and without polarization in the end. So what is the existing landscape and what can an EIC add in that case? That goes back directly at the capabilities of a provider. 
So, so far, we've seen these type of observables only in fixed target experiments. For construction, that means that you're rather limited to this X region that is dominated by quark structure, where you know that gluons actually are a very important part of the nucleon structure itself. What about their spins in the end? We saw these units or more of H bar that one can easily hide. Okay, so in EIC, indeed, you'll add orders of magnitude, uh, both in Q squared at a fixed X and in X reach uh, to this um, study. Capability in this case comes about from a combination of collider with polarization. Okay, and just because you've been able to create polarization in a fixed target does not mean that you can collide. It took about 15 years or so of rig development to actually get to the first polarized hadronic collider but in the end. Nothing small about it. What will that do? Well, you have now the opportunity, or you will have the opportunity to indeed directly look for these logarithmic derivatives of structure functions, and with that, get insight whether delta G is positive or negative, and how large it actually is. And I think that these type of derivatives, if you can see them directly for an experimentalist, that's easier than doing all the contributions, which is, of course, in the end, how you get the real answer. Of course, there are experimental challenges to it. And now, in terms of impact, here you see impact fits, right? So you went through the machinery with the pseudo data. And what you see indeed is that uh, over a very large range in Bjorken X, you will make significant impact even in a quantity you think you know rather well, quark spin contribution, but in particular in your gluon spin contribution. Of course, at unmeasured small x, you can always insert a delta function or something to um, make anyone's life miserable. In terms of this subtraction, you see that worked out here. And then here to um, just encourage again that theory friends speak up. Indeed, precisions get to the point where you can ask questions about orbital momenta in a full moment sense. And then, well, you need a lecture. What does it mean, orbital momenta? What rotates uh, around each other, et cetera. And that's, that's a great discussion that will take another 10 years, I'm sure, as well. But that's number two, right? I mean, ask a very fundamental question. Slow down your theory, friends, so that you can come catch up in experiments. Okay, um, semi-inclusive deep inelastic scattering, right? I mean, this, this question about strange quarks, if you have particle identification over there, it's an infinite joy, this, this point, up, um, then you are likely to gain additional sensitivity to the struck parton inside that proton. So a kaon is more likely to contain which will have originated from a strange quark, let's say, than a pion, just by its intrinsic structure. Of course, I have introduced two non-perturbative objects, so you need to resolve them, etc. It's, it's complicated, still, it's possible in an adequately equipped experiment. Uh, and you can see that even in the polarized case, you get to large impacts uh, on your strange quark felicity distribution. Also, felicity average distribution, you would expect it to improve significantly. Now again, graduating uh, beyond the PDF, right? I mean, this was all this, this broadband beam of gluons, if you wish, uh, graduating beyond. So there are two paths, as I indicated before. Uh, one of them is called TMDs, because look, as physicists, not only do we come up with great names for structure, and how creative is it? A, W, F. We also come up with acronyms that are really convincing. So TMDs, Obvious, you have many of them. Uh, likewise, GPDs makes for a great bar conversation. Okay, so maybe better just do this in the evening here, right? I mean, this, this bar thing may not work so well, but uh, you see them compared here. Uh, I think that they're highly complementary. Uh, and it's worthwhile, again, to think in terms of experimental capabilities. What do we get, right? So let's first look at the TMD matter. TMDs are typically about semi inclusive physics where you resolve a second momentum. Uh, axes. So again, you see the existing data and data that is to come populates the valence uh, region, I would say, and a bit more, of course, right? So it sort of stops at 10 minus 2 at a small scale. EIC again affords you these orders of magnitude. Impact from that is again very significant. So here you see a QCD evolution evaluation of this type of measurements with its impact going from green to blue. So that comes about again from the capability of being able to do this at a fixed X value for many, many Q squared values that span a large range. 
in a way, this is similar to, um, in terms of capabilities, it's similar, I would say, to the inclusive measurements. It's about bringing the collider strengths to this entire field. Then impact figures, well, we've seen some of them before. Hopefully, uh, once EIC is online for a few years, we will make this into reality, this type of pictures. Um, situation for GPDs is a bit different, I would say. It's not so much about kinematic range, but it's rather about the precision of data that one can achieve. So here, you actually compete with prior measurements made at HERA, at least an initial set of them, that have measured the T dependence over a fair range, albeit with rather large uncertainties, as you can see over here. That's because it's a rare process and because this cross-section also drops rather rapidly. Yeah. Here you see the corresponding quality of data projected for the EIC. So indeed a later experiment where the luminosity plus aspects of how you measure is T. So making a dedicated experiment now that you know what you're after will actually really come to the forefront. Again, in terms of impact, this is the type of thing we would hope to uh, see in the not too long future. And I'll go a bit further. When people advertise the EIC as uh, a femtoscope or a microscope, last time I operated microscope, it was pretty simple, right? I mean, you sort of focused, you looked and you had an image. It would be superb if computing actually gets to the level where we have on day <laughs> as EIC gets online, we have real-time analysis. It's for the computing friends among us. Um, nuclei, um, similar story again, okay. Uh, truth in advertising there is that if the LHEC would come online in any reasonable time frame, of course, its center of mass energy will be higher. So in other words, there is no competition if you know that this facility comes online. It's also not necessarily about competition, it could be about timeline. Okay. Insights do happen in, um, call it incremental ways, if you wish. Um, of course, you also have the versatility of the EIC compared to the LHC. I would also say that an LHEC would be a high energy physics driven machine from this experimentalist's um, perspective. That comes with very different requirements, actually, for whether such a thing truly can come online or not. Okay, nuclear landscape, let me just quickly go through that uh, again in terms of impact, depending on the probe you're after, this can be rather large. Um, it allows you to probe in sensitive ways, even from the inclusive side at this phenomenon called saturation. In the end though, you can ask yourself like, look, if this is, let's call it your discovery potential, can you A, demonstrate that you have it at five sigma? Well, that answer is no, um, because that's not how nuclear physics works. And if you cannot do that, do you have complementary probes? And one of them is shown over here. So that's, that's a dijet correlation where one of the two jets propagates through this dense environment and gets equilibrated uh, in it. And that results in a broadening of this jet structure in the end. Uh, likewise, I mean, if you indeed have this very dense gluonic environment, you could do a classic diffraction experiment in the end, right? So you look for your diffraction patterns. Depending on the blackness of that disk, uh, it would actually change. Now, in experiment, that is a complete and utter horror, because what you need to do is measure a cross section that actually drops or rises in very small intervals in T, in that case by about an order of magnitude, and you would like to indeed do that with multiples. That is exceedingly hard experimentally here in the end. Okay, I mean, where most of us, I think at some point have looked at things like unfolding, and then you realize like, hmm, simple concept gets complex quickly. This is not the type of thing you want to unfold. Yes, you need to measure. It's um, experimentally just challenging. Now, uh, this I will skip in the interest of time. Uh, like to come to the close, right? I mean, we're starting to compete with hungry stomachs and all of that. Um, this was our goal for today. I hope I've provided you with a bit of insight how an EIC will be worldwide unique. I think it is a combination of factors, and most important in that are, of course, the communities. 
put a number of physicists in a room and remarkably creative things can come out. And then to realize them is step two. I think we are at a unique place where that actually may become a reality. Okay, so it will be a combination of theory, as always in physics. It will be a combination with experiments, as always in physics. But especially also with our friends in accelerator science, it's, it's a truly astounding area of physics to be in at the moment, I think. Very creative experimental work comes about there at this point. Many societal applications of that as well. And so it's in this case a really three pronged uh, approach that is needed. Uh, I think for nuclear physics purposes, uh, we have a number of profound questions that will be addressed. Of course, there are many other opportunities, and there is ample um, evidence for surprise in nature, provided that you actually look, also in places where you expect little to do that. Um, and again, I mean, I hope that I've given you a flash overview of how the new capability and measurements, at least qualitatively come together, where they come about, in which areas there are strengths. What I've not covered is, of course, other aspects of societal benefits. So let me stop here. Um, yeah, you should just interrupt. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I just wanted to uh, get more insight in the uh, um, experimental uh, regarding the AIC. So, like the particles that will be colliding, uh, in this case, we've seen, I think the heaviest is uh, iron, uh, lithium iron, uh, iron. uranium. Uranium. If it's unpolarized. Okay. It goes to very heavy beams, right? So Rick, at this point, routinely collides gold ions. The LHC routinely collides lead ions, lead ions with one another. Uh, both those capabilities will be preserved into the EIC era. Okay, so but, but to start with, uh, with AIC, so um, because the energy is so far looked to be between 20 and 140 GeV. So for those energies, we uh, first end at uh, lithium, right? Yes. Maybe in the future, yeah. once the central mass energies are increased, then we go to heavier. So the range of EIC energies, um, that's, that's actually an interesting question um, also for an evening discussion, right? Suppose you have a 27, suppose you have an EIC experiment. So you have an 18 GeV electron beam and I have a 100 GeV per nucleon ion beam. Which beam energy should I emphasize to increase, to increase my center of mass energy? Will be a good topic for discussion in the evening. Um, now, in terms of the capability, at this point, the EIC is foreseen in the case of its heavy ion capabilities to reach this 100 GeV per ion. Okay, in the case of protons, it can go up to 140 GeV per ion. In the case of the electron, it goes up to 18 GeV. And those are top energies at this point. Um, I am not currently aware of energy upgrade plans to those values. But, I mean, you can always talk about energy upgrade intent. That's fine. We would all like to do that but I'm not aware of actual plans at this point to, to increase that. Does that help or? Uh... Yeah, it does help. Okay. The, the other thing maybe is just saturation. Uh, does it have to do with the collision particles? Oh. It's of light or in heavier. <laughs> it, I think in the first lecture, I heard something like, uh, you, you know, uh, you're looking at the separation of the, of the quarks. So, uh, to tell, for example, which quark uh, collided with the electron. But once that separation is not enough, then uh, this kind of saturation um, arises. So I'm looking in terms of the uh, heavier um, nuclei and lighter nuclei. So how I would think about that as an experimentalist. Uh, so that's an experimental perspective, and I'll, I'll leave it to some of my theory friends to comment then. Um, first off, I would ask, 
are quark and gluon degrees of freedom still the effective degrees of freedom to describe a system that is recombining if you wish in this form um, it's intuitive to think about it but i think if you want to truly develop let's say almost that where predictive power it isn't that's one one comment i would make the second comment from an experimental point of view the um Proton is, is um, of course, one object, right? and the only way how you can increase the number of gluons that you encounter is by probing smaller values of X, which inevitably means higher square root of S. In the case of a nucleus, you have a bunch of protons, neutrons, right, nucleons, if you wish, stacked behind each other. And as you collide that, the collision actually is the, the spatial extent there doesn't matter okay, in this direction. And that's the strength actually of building up the number of nucleons. And that's how this A to the one third for which we saw some evidence actually comes about. So that's where the trade-off between let's say an EA and an EP collider at higher energies comes in. And then the question, will you see saturation at the EIC or not? Of course, I don't know. Okay, who does? You can make a we have tantalizing observations. We don't have conclusive proof. As an experimentalist, how do you go about that? You just say, well, okay, this is the densest environment that uh, can reasonably be achieved in my lifetime. If I find this sufficiently interested. I jump into the pool. And I find out how deep it is. Okay, and you may end up being disappointed. You may also strike gold. You get about five shots of that as an experimental physicist. Everything worthwhile takes about 10 years. Okay, so the only thing I would say, pick with conviction, whatever you do.